Hello and warmest greetings from Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. This is the Church of the Resurrection, another worship service from our church to you. Thanks for joining us. My name is Dan Clare. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I want to invite you to join in worship. God is with us even though we're far apart from one another. God is with us wherever we gather and uh, come and join with him now and with us in worship together. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in saying the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's sing together. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Now let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, kneeling together, first in silence and then aloud. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now please stand and hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's sing his praises together.
Cascade, Maryland, and we've been attending Res for about 14 years. Please join us in praying the Colic for Children. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed our congregation with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as you bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. We've been studying the book of Genesis, a book about beginnings. And today, we're gonna talk about a story that has a sad ending, but it's not the real ending. It's actually another beginning. Can you make your heart quiet with me as we get ready to hear God's good words? When God created everything, the whole earth and everything in it was good. And in the midst of creation, there was a garden, a wonderful garden. It was God's garden. Adam was in this garden. And so was Eve. They lived happily in the garden because God had created man and woman in his image. And all the creatures lived in the garden. Adam was in the garden and he was close to God. And he was close to Eve. And he was close to creation. And Eve was there too. She was in right relationship with God and with Adam and in right relationship with creation. And God blessed them. In the middle of the garden there grew a tree. And God told Adam and Eve that they could eat the fruit from every tree in the garden except for the one tree in the middle. If they even touched the fruit from that tree, they would surely die. Now, God had a terrible enemy. His name was Satan. Satan had once been a beautiful angel, but Satan was full of pride and hate and evil, and he wanted to be God, so he was banished from heaven. And Satan was looking for a way to hurt God. 
He wanted to stop this beautiful story that God was creating. So Satan disguised himself as a serpent and hid in the middle of the garden. The serpent was clever and crafty. He went to Adam and Eve and he whispered to them a terrible lie. He said, you will certainly not die if you eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God knows that if you eat from this tree, you will know things that you have never known before and you will become like God. Does God really love you? The serpent whispered. If he does, why won't he just let you eat from this tree, this delicious fruit? Perhaps God doesn't want you to be happy. Perhaps God doesn't want you to become like him. The serpent told Adam and Eve to taste the fruit from the tree that God had forbid. And they did. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree, everything that was all together fell apart. The good and right relationship that they had with God fell apart. Their good relationship with one another fell apart. And their good and right relationship with all of creation fell apart. The good order of all creation fell apart. After they ate fr the fruit from the tree, they hid. And God was walking in the garden and called to them. Usually, when Adam and Eve heard God's voice, they ran to him. But this time they hid. They were full of shame. They did not know how to be with God anymore because everything had fallen apart. But God found them, and his heart was broken. They had broken the one rule that God had given them, and because they broke that rule, they had broken their wonderful relationship with God. Sin had come into God's garden, into the perfect world, and it would never leave. From now on, everything would die, even though it was meant to live forever. From now on, God's children would always be running away from God and hiding from him. God told Adam and Eve that they could not stay in the garden. It was no longer their home. They had to leave. But before they left, God clothed them and sent them out of the garden. And this, this is the end of our story for today. But it's not the end of the actual story. You see, even though God's people turned from him, God would not leave them. He already had a plan to rescue his people, to rescue them from their sin, to rescue them from the serpent, and to rescue them from death through his son, Jesus. Let's wonder about our story today. When God's people listen to the serpent, instead of listening to God, they sinned. But God loved them so much that he did not leave them alone. God's son, Jesus, came to save the people who had turned away from God. I wonder, what do you think it was like to live in the garden when it was perfect? To walk with God in the garden, to talk with God, 
can I imagine being close to God too? I wonder, what did it feel like to suddenly be afraid of God, to want to hide from him? Have I ever felt like I wanted to hide from someone that I love? How does that feel in my body and in my heart? Are there parts of me that I want to hide from God, from my family, from my friends? Can I believe that God always wants to come find me, even when I hide? Our story today ended in a sad place. And sometimes when we look around our world today, we see a lot of sadness and brokenness. But God has promised to make it right through his son, Jesus. What needs to be made right in the world around you, in your school, in your heart, in our city? Can we ask Jesus to come and save it? Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for never letting us go, even when we hide from you. Thank you that even though people disobeyed, you refused to stay apart from us. Thank you that you have promised us a savior. Come and rescue us and turn our hearts to you so that we walk with you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join us in praying the Collect of the Day. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Rachel Trigo, and I live in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington, D.C. I've been at Res for 14 years. Our psalm today is Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises the vile person, but honors the one who fears the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends to the poor without interest and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hi, my name is Allison Beatty, and I started coming to Res this year. Our New Testament lesson for this morning is James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to you. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome to you. It's great to be with you here at Church of the Resurrection. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Today, we're starting a new series through the book of James. And so let me just say a couple of things by way of orienting us to this book of the New Testament. James is a letter, and we can tell from the first verse, which tells us both who wrote the letter and to whom it was written. It was written, we're told, by someone named James, who further identifies himself as only a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are seven, six or seven Jameses in the New Testament. But this James was evidently well known enough that he could just give his first name with no other identifying information and be known to his readers around the world, really, at that time. And the only James well known enough to fit the bill is James, the younger brother of Jesus. You see, we're told in the Gospels, particularly in John's Gospel in chapter 7, that Jesus had younger siblings, particularly brothers. And we're told that his brothers didn't believe in him. But then we see something interesting happen in 1 Corinthians 15 when we're told about all the people that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. James, in particular, is mentioned there. We also see James present in the book of Galatians as a leader of the church in Jerusalem and also in the book of Acts, playing an important role in Jerusalem at the council that happens in Acts chapter 15. Aside from those little bit of, uh, that, that little bit of information, we really don't know much about James on a personal level. We know that he must have had an incredible conversion story to be the brother of Jesus and not believe in him and, and then go to be believing in him and be the leader of one of the most important churches in the ancient world. We also know from history, uh, church history, that he was brutally tortured and martyred in Jerusalem in the year 62 AD, sealing his witness with his death, refusing to renounce his faith in Jesus. As far as the addressees of this letter are concerned, uh, all, w the people addressed are evidently all the, earlier believe all the early believers in Jesus, the vast majority of whom would have been Jewish, uh, spread around the known world at that time, the dispersion. There were communities of Jews in virtually every part of the known world, and these communities were referred to collectively as the diaspora, or the dispersion. And the church, you'll remember in Acts, it first spread after Pentecost when Jews who were gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world were then sent out back to where they had come from. And as the Jesus movement starts to spread among this Jewish dispersion around the world, we know that before too long, these believers began to be ostracized by their Jewish brothers and sisters who didn't believe in Jesus. So we don't know too many details about James. We don't know too much about the audience that James was writing to because it was a general audience. There's not a lot that needs to be said about the historical background of James. But what we do need to keep in mind is one simple fact, that James is writing to people all over the world who are starting to face serious difficulties. James's readers are facing trials. Following Jesus puts them in a multitude of situations where they can either be faithful to Jesus and because of that faith encounter difficulty, or they can compromise their faith in Jesus in order to avoid difficulty and suffering. Their faith is continually on trial. Do they really trust in Jesus or not? And while our context is so different from this first, that of first century Jewish believers, we too know that being a Christian is to face a nearly constant trial, to come up against unwanted difficulties or suffering, Situations that seem like they'd be so much easier if only we didn't have to be faithful to and obey Jesus and trust in him. And James opens his book and he goes right to the heart of, of that situation that his readers knew and that we encounter continually. And he says, count it all joy as you face trials. 
Easier said than done, right? So you see, trials are no joke. Trials are a real danger. They are a genuine threat to us. They strike at the core of our being. Trials are not just simple tests. They're not things to mess around with. The word for trials here in verse 2 is in Greek the word perosmos. And if you look into it, you'll find it's the word from which we get the term pirate. It refers to an attack, an assault, an attempted robbery. It's the same exact word that you will find in verses 13 and 14, which we'll look at next week, where they're translated as temptation. See, a trial is a difficulty that entices or tempts you to turn from God to some other source of strength or comfort. A trial is an assault on faith. If you've ever read John Bunyan's allegorical account of the Christian life, The Pilgrim's Progress, you'll remember towards the beginning of the book, uh, when Christian just starts out on his journey, he ha he's had the burden of sin removed, he's received the scroll that directs him to the celestial city, but before long, he comes to the hill of difficulty. And there at the bottom, he sees the narrow path that goes up and over the hill of difficulty, the path that he is being directed to walk. But then around on both sides, you'll remember that he sees these two men beckoning him to take some different winding paths that go around the hill of difficulty, promising that he can get there without faithfully following the path laid out for him. Facing the difficulty, he's tempted to leave the path of faithfulness to Christ and to head off in a different direction. Of course, he doesn't do that, and he will confirm only later that both of those paths would have led him to death. Trials... Facing trials is like facing the hill of difficulty, not because the thing we face is so bad that it can undo us, but because of the temptation that it presents for us to leave the way of trust in Christ. We often find ourselves standing at the bottom of a hill of difficulty, facing trials. Many of us right now, unwanted suffering or difficulty. And the reason they are dangerous is because they present us with a temptation to abandon the way that Jesus has called us. See, trials are a real danger to faith. They tempt us away from God and they strike at the core of our being. And trials, they come in various shapes and sizes. Temptations to place our trust in something other than God come in a multitude of forms and they can be different for everyone. James says here in verse two, again, when you meet trials of various kinds, literally multicolored trials, for James's readers and, and for some Christians in the world today, what tests faith, what presents a trial is, is living in a society that persecutes them for following Christ. That following Christ would mean the loss of social status, maybe economic loss, maybe even bodily harm. Yet this verse isn't entirely distant from our own situation. These words don't only apply to trials that come at us from without, they also apply to trials that originate from within. Many kinds of trials, various kinds of trials applies to situations not only where we face the difficulty of outward pressure and threat, but where we battle with inward desires that would tempt us to compromise our faith in Jesus. James will refer throughout this book not only to the trials that are occasioned by poverty and suffering, but those that are brought about by proximity to wealth and power. And there are many kinds of trials even today. There are Christians who are in jobs where being faithful to, to what Christ commands would generate blowback. There are Christians in universities or schools who face mockery or ridicule for their witness to Jesus. 
They're Christians who have a crisis of faith when they face di disease or sickness. And as we've already said, affluence itself can be a temptation to abandon God and to trust in other things. The point is trials can be different for everyone. Temptations to place our trust in something other than God come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So trials are dangerous, they're deadly, they're sneaky, but James also wants us to know that trials can be an amazing opportunity for us. Trials can bring our faith to maturity. Trials can push us to a whole new level of trust in God. They may be dangerous, but they're also an opportunity because they test and they prove our faith. Like a metal smith's fire, they melt down our faith into its basic components and the dross, the rubbish, it rises to the top and what is left is a more pure, valuable material. See, the reality is, is that our faith in Jesus is always mixed with so much unbelief. Areas of our heart where we really don't trust in the goodness of God as our Father, our provider, our Savior. And trials have this way of bringing us face to face with these areas within our own lives. And they give us this opportunity to give these places over to God, an opportunity to have our faith increase in quality for it to become a persevering faith. I think Christian maturity is principally measured by how deeply we trust in God's love and providence for us as his children. The only way for us to grow up in Christ is to trust God through difficult situations. We struggle with trusting God through that period of unemployment or singleness or disease or infertility or marital difficulty and we come out on the other side with an experiential knowledge of how trustworthy God is after all. And this leads us to love him more, to worship him more, and to trust him even more. We come out on the other side with more joy and stability in our lives, having seen God take care of us even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. C.S. Lewis famously says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but screams in our pains. Trials accelerate our maturity because they push us to this whole new place of trust in God. Or at least they can. You see, in the midst of trials, we need desperately divine help. If trials are going to make us more mature rather than destroy us, we need resources that we do not possess. We need wisdom, as verse 5 says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask a God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. You know, when I hear the word wisdom, I tend to think of a kind of cleverness or human know-how or ingenuity, practical skill. There's a reason for that, but I don't think that's what's primarily being discussed here. You see, in the Bible, wisdom is not just cleverness or human know-how. Wisdom is one of the central attributes of God himself. Proverbs 8 tells us it was through wisdom that God fashioned the world. We see in multiple places that Jesus Christ is said to be wisdom incarnate. God himself is wisdom and all wisdom comes from him. And so what James is saying here in verse five is that to endure the trials and temptations I face, I need God himself. I need God's presence and perspective. I am only as wise as I am close to God. You see, it doesn't matter 
necessarily how old or ex experienced you are or how young and inexperienced you are. I can be a wise young person if I'm relying on the presence and power of God in my life. Or I can be an old foolish person if I rely on my own perspective. Like an airplane pilot flying through a great storm, we can only make it if we rely on the instruments that are there in the cockpit. If I rely on my own observations out the window in the midst of a storm, I will crash and burn. And going through trials is like that as well. See, in the midst of trials, we need divine help, we need wisdom, we need God himself. And the beautiful thing here in this passage is that help is not far off. God himself is not far off. Wisdom is ours through prayer. It's, it's all about simply asking. Verse five says that all that's necessary to get this wisdom, the presence of God in our lives, is, is to ask for help. If anyone lacks wisdom, James says, they need only to ask God who gives generously to all and without reproach or without finding fault. Didn't Jesus say something similar in the Gospels when he told us that just as no earthly father would give his child a stone when they ask for bread, so neither would our heavenly father fail to give his Holy Spirit to any of his children who ask for it. We just ask. You know, in it, there's a, an old FedEx Super Bowl ad. Um, well, it, it was at least a few years ago, maybe five or six. And there was an actor in it who looked like Tom Hanks uh, from the movie Cast Away. And if you've never seen it, Cast Away is a movie about a FedEx pilot who crash lands on an island in the South Pacific and stays there alone for four years before almost going crazy, uh, before finally being rescued. And anyways, in this ad, this uh, actor that looks like Tom Hanks uh, in Castaway, he, he is um, on the island and he's a faithful FedEx uh, pilot and he's got one package that didn't fall into the ocean. And he's a very faithful FedEx pilot, so he saves it. He doesn't open it. And finally, he gets rescued, and he takes that package uh, to the person to whom it's addressed, and he gives it to them. And, and at the end of the ad, he says, you know, I can't help but asking, what, what's in the package anyways? And the woman he gives it to says, oh, nothing, just some flares and a GPS device and a water purifier and uh, some seeds and a, tel a satellite telephone. All along, according to this ad, there he is on the island with everything he needs, but he simply didn't take advantage of it. I think that's like us so much of the time as Christians facing difficulties in front of us is we try to do it in our own strength when it's so stupid because if we would only believe what the word of God says, we already have access to what we really need. If only we'd ask. If only we'd open that gift. You see, wisdom's not far away at all. Help is not far away. Wisdom is ours through prayer, in the presence of God in the midst of trials. It's true that God gives his help to anyone who asks. God's full of grace to all of us. The least deserving among us can come to God and receive everything from him. Remember, it says here that God gives generously to all without finding fault or without reproach. God doesn't look at us as strangers coming to his door looking for help. We are his very own children for whom Christ has died. He wouldn't think of refusing us. You know, God is not like those people who uh, make others feel stupid when they don't know something. You ever around someone like that? It's terrible. He's not like us who sees another person's weakness or ignorance or shame as a cause for their own pride. Instead, God 
just wants to help us in this process of proving our faith, growing in our, our faith, which is to grow in the knowledge and love of him. That's why the Bible says, when we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Before we even knew we needed help, God gave us the help we needed by sending Jesus. God's wisdom is for everyone to receive as a gift. So we come before a God as we sit in trials and challenges, we come before a God who is full of grace, who's willing to draw near to the least deserving among us. But as we come to the end of this passage, the last part of this little passage running through verse eight, it's a challenge. After such an emphasis on God's generosity and his grace, his willingness to help, there's this kind of stark and perhaps frightening challenge. And it's a challenge to decision. Ask and you will receive, but the asking has to be done in the right way. We've got to believe and not doubt, James says. What it means not to doubt is that we don't live non-committal lives. We aren't double-minded or literally two-souled. A two-souled person is a person who never fully commits to Jesus. They're always hanging around the margins of commitment, always dipping their toes in the water, but they've got these certain parts of their heart that they aren't willing to give up to Christ. I'll follow Jesus only if it doesn't conflict with fill in the blank, my sexual ethics, my career, only if it doesn't cause me to be looked down on by other people, only if it's on my terms. And all of those attitudes show that I'm two-souled or double-minded. When we come to God in that state and we say, God, help me, we're, we're like the person who goes to a friend and asks for advice, but we've already made up our mind what we want to hear. And so if they don't tell us what we want to hear, we go find someone else to tell us what we want to hear. And James says, if you're like that, you're unstable in all your ways. In the book of Joshua, to close here, the people of Israel stood at the bottom of their own hill of difficulty. They're entering this phase of life where they've got to go in and conquer the promised land, to trust in God, to exercise real faith. And they're tempted to take an easy way out. They're tempted to blend the values of faith in God with the, the false gods of, of the land. But Joshua, their leader, would have none of it. He wouldn't let them be double-minded. He says, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. What about you? Our new and better Joshua, Jesus, says, I will give you everything you need. But choose, will you follow me? Do you want to follow me? Will you do what I say? If you think you can follow Jesus and follow the other gods all around, you'll never get anywhere with him. But if you'll cons commit yourself to him in spite of the difficulty it entails, you'll be transformed, led through that difficulty. So what will it be? That's the kind of thing we're gonna be looking at over the next uh, several weeks as we travel through the book of James. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why these years of waiting here? The
Good morning. We're Jordan and Aaron Ridge. We live in Mount Pleasant, D.C., and we've been attending rest for about nine months. Please join us in the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Steve Breedlove, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Donald Trump, our Mayor Muriel Bowser, the Governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, and the Governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those affected by COVID-19, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life and the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Please feel free to add any additional petitions at home. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please join us as we pray the way the Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hi, I'm Chris Carter. I live in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and I've been attending Res for two months. Please join me in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ. Send greetings of peace to friends and family near and far. And as you do, let me again bid you greetings in Jesus' name from here on Capitol Hill, the Church of the Resurrection. We're so glad that you've joined us for this service today. You'll see on the screen information that you can find on our website at reschurch.org. All kinds of things about uh, how to get involved, how to connect, especially if you're new. You can also sign up if you're new uh, to be a part of our newcomers Zoom that will happen on the 20th of September in the evening. We'd love to have you be a part of that if you haven't done one of those before. Also, for those who are local, we're having another Eucharist in the park on the 20th of September at 1145 in Lincoln Park, and you're most welcome to join us for that. Bring your own bread, your own mug, and a picnic blanket, and you can meet us in the park and join in the celebration of the Lord's Supper together. Finally, this is when in our services, when we're together, we always take up an offering. It's a way that we worship the Lord by our giving. And your giving helps to support our gospel ministry in this program and in things that we do throughout the city and around the world. Thank you for your generous giving to support the church. Now we'll sing together again, and I'll be back to say farewell.
Thanks again for joining us. Receive the benediction. All our problems. We send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties. We send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works. We send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes. We set on the risen Christ. Christ, the Son of righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this week and forever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. Bye-bye.